Welcome back to Blueprint for Wealth. I'm Wayne Zell, your host of this fast paced half hour hour show. It depends on who's on as our special guest. And today, my special guest is my friend and collaborator, Tian Wong. Welcome, Tian. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be here. It's it's great to, uh, it's great to have you. It's great to know you. I've I've known you for many years, and it's it's I'll I'll give the the listeners a little bit of background on you. Um, Tian is the ultimate entrepreneur. He's a CEO. He's a private investor. He's into capital raising. Um, you know anything you want to know about entrepreneurship and raising capital? This guy will tell you about. And currently, he's the CEO and founder of a company called Opus 8, which is a private investment and advisory firm that invests in contact centers, BPO, market tech, CRM, health tech, and fintech. And he's also the founder and sort of lead on the Connectpreneur Forum. So we're gonna talk about Opus 8 a little bit. We'll talk about Connectpreneur. And then we're gonna learn some of his secrets to his success as an entrepreneur and the greatest challenges that uh, he's faced as an entrepreneur over the years. So uh, with that, uh, let's let's dig in. Tian, um, when did you found Opus 8? Uh, founded in, uh, at the end of 2002. Which was a really hard time to start a, a business in, in it, technology. It was a hard time, kind of but I was in the process of selling my other company. So I needed an investment vehicle. So I set up Opus 8 to be our investment vehicle at the time. So it was really, that was the sole purpose was just to have a, um, have an entity that can go and make investments. It was right after the tech bubble burst, as I recall. And uh, that was probably a good time to be making investments in assets that may have been devalued substantially as a result of the, uh, of the bubble bursting. Yeah, I mean, you're right in hindsight, but at the time you sort of do what you can do and you worry about what you can control. And we didn't even think about the macro market where we were just trying to be, you know, opportunistic. Absolutely. So, yeah. So today, what does Opus 8 consist of? What do you do in that business today? So right now we've morphed Opus 8. So we went from being a pure investor. And then when 08 hit, we became a pure consulting firm. And we did uh, do follow on investments in, we invested about 25 different opportunities. Um, but we did do some follow on investments. And then, and then we stayed sort of got involved in consulting, we started working with private equity funds and venture capital funds and helping them raise money with institutional limited partners. So we built a business around that as a consulting business. And we've kept that going. Um, now we raise money for alternative investment managers. And we also raise money for high quality companies. Um, and we've built a pretty tremendous network of over 3000 accredited high net worth private investors, family offices, um, institutional VC partners, and, uh, and others that invest in companies and funds that we bring to them. And we're not a registered broker dealer. We convene these uh, private events, and that's gone pretty well. And Opus 8 also organizes the Connectpreneur series. And um, the third thing we're doing, the most important, is that we are in the process of acquiring uh, BPO and call center assets right now and using that as a platform to continue growing because that, between my partners and myself, that's our background. So um, we see a lot of opportunity in that space over the next five to 10 years. And that's where we're sort of um, focusing. I know what call centers are, but what's BPO? Well, call centers are a subset of BPO. BPO stands for business process outsourcing. So any sort of back office functions that you might be outsourcing, such as um, transcriptions, translations, data processing, uh, processing calls. So yeah, that's what we mean by BPO. Do you have uh, investments overseas or are you bringing overseas investors to the US to invest in assets here? Uh, both. We have a big network of international high net worth individuals and family offices, as well as international institutional limited partners. But um, in terms of our acquisition strategy, because BPO and call center um, has now an acceptable, um, you know, uh, use of outsourcing and offshoring, we have a lot of a lot of the companies we're looking at have operations overseas. So let's talk about Connectpreneur because that that is a, a phenomenon. Really, it started out. You said to me before we we started recording um, that you were really trying to promote the companies that you were thinking about investing in or that you were investing in, what, how, it, how did it morph into what it is today and what is it doing today? And 
What's your vision for Connectpreneur? Yeah, so Connectpreneur started, this is our 11th year. So uh, we started it as a way to promote two technology companies that we had a majority interest in. So it was, uh, we, were, we would do these series of CEO breakfasts and CEO lunches every quarter. And we did a set for one company, we did another set for the other company. And then somebody said to me, well, why are you doing that? Just consolidate, just have one big event with more people, more CEOs. And the one thing we knew about the CEOs we discovered was, you know, we had them come together for networking and also to hear us pitch. Um, but we found they stayed for like an hour afterwards, just hanging out, talking to each other. And my bulb went off. It's like, these guys really like being with each other. And myself as a CEO, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I want to, it's, it's lonely at the top. We're running a business. It's, um, you don't get to hang out with peers very often. So that was what we did with Connectpreneur. We're like, well, why don't we get these investors in a room and we'll get some CEOs in a room and it'll be like a business fest, you know? Okay. Um, and okay. then the service providers that want to come, they want to be there because they have- They want the CEOs as clients. Yeah. Yeah. Target rich environment, wealth managers. So we got all these sponsors um, and we limited, you know, the service providers at the time when we started and we were solely in Northern Virginia. And then- um, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland called us. They said, come to Bethesda. So they made it uh, they made it palatable for us to go to Bethesda. So we started expanding to Bethesda. We expanded to Baltimore, Columbia, Maryland, D then DC and Arlington. So we were doing about eight events a year in person. And, um, you know, we started with a small 140 people at the Tower Club. And then, you know, we're now doing 600 people or so before the pandemic at our events. Where do you uh, host these coming events? in? Where do they, where, where are the events hosted if they're not virtual? Uh, well, we were doing them in person. So we were doing them at the Fairview Park Marriott, yeah. uh, different hotels and venues, Bethesda Hyatt, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we did one at GW, Marymount University Business School, the Tower Club. Um, Capital One has their world headquarters at Huge Atrium. We, Absolutely. We filled the yeah. So how, we do you, did how do you decide who is a qualified candidate to present at Connectpreneur? We have an investment committee, so we we review all the submissions of people that want to present, and uh, obviously you're looking for all the boxes to be checked. You know, huge market, differentiated product, great management team, um, you know, viable investment opportunity. Um, and we so it's not of, just it's not just a startup that's just starting up with an idea. These are companies that have really tried to launch, launched, even gotten some angel investment to to start them off. Yeah, we've had over 800 companies, believe it or not, present over the last 10 years. And we do have some people, two, two people in a garage. We've had some MBA students or um, a couple undergrads. But for the most part, they've already raised this, you know, a seed round or a friends and family round. And right. so we, you know, the guys that are presenting a Connectpreneur, they're either looking for sort of a post seed round, pre A round or A round. But we've also had B and C round and public companies present, too. And some who's people the who's the connect. greatest success that came out of the Connectpreneur presentation that you? Well, we just had yesterday, two days ago, Kirbyo just raised sixty-five million bucks, and Rick is a former speaker of ours. He presented last year, um, and he's got a lot of investors that are also part of our con Connectpreneur community. But I don't know what the largest success is. Um, but we've had a lot of exits. We've had a lot of companies that have exited for nine figures. Wow. So, Awesome. You know, so, uh, yeah. Great to We've hear. Had, yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, it's, we started this thing to sort of promote entrepreneurship in the DC area and then mid Atlantic and entrepreneurs are looking for peer support. They're looking for capital. And one thing we have is access to investors and capital. So, you know, we really stayed true to our mission and was not a money-making venture at the time. It was just, let's, our attitude was like, it, let's not lose money. And if we lose money, it's sort of, we'll consider it marketing budget, you know? Right. But um, that was sort of the way we looked at, at Connectpreneur initially, just to be a service to the community. And we still do very much so. Our community's expanded. It's gone beyond the East Coast. Now it's national and even international, but we want to support all entrepreneurs um, in whatever way they, they have. You know, we have our alumni network, so we have um, Slack channels for them. We have a Slack channel for our community. We uh, we put their videos up on our YouTube channel. We support these guys with master classes. So we have some of our top uh, ambassadors in our community. They will do master classes for our alumni. And um, you know, every day I'm talking to two to three alumni um, minimum from even people from eight, nine, ten years ago. 
Is it so a membership really program? It really feels like a community, you know? Is it a membership program that the alumni continue to participate in? I mean, how um, how can somebody get involved in, in Connectpreneur if they were interested? Well, if they're presenting, they pay a fee. And part of the fee involves prep work and and some a little bit of coaching. And right. we review their deck, their executive summary. We help them with their pitch. We do the rehearsals. And then they're, they can come to all of our in-person events for free. All forever right. so we treat it is treated like a membership but it's a one-time you know thing and then they're they're in for life basically and people yeah. come more and more people who get involved more and more people are coming to these events they get sold out they can't get a ticket so um you're you're opening up in chicago i understand and then you're also go are you on the west coast as well no, not yet. Our, our target markets are Atlanta, New York, New Jersey, Boston, and Chicago. So okay. We're hoping to expand into those markets um, by next year. And then Kansas City, Denver, LA are on the docket for the following year. Slowly making the exodus towards the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got a lot of people in the Valley and in LA who... I was going to say, I yeah. you know, that... That to me is, you, you can't miss it. If you go out there, there's going to be an entrepreneur. It's like shooting fish in a barrel or something like that. Um, what's your vision for Connectpreneur? Where do you think this is headed? Well, when the pandemic hit, we had to, we had to uh, pivot very quickly. Within two weeks, we had, uh, we had an event planned at American University. They Obviously, we canceled it at the end of March. So we yes. had to pivot. So we, we uh, wound up um, doing a pretty successful event uh, online at the end of March of 2020. And, um, and then we kind of, the rest is history. So now, you know, we've been doing these every month. We've done 24 virtual events. They're the world's largest investor pitch events. Um, you know, these are meetings. So every attendee can see every other attendee. So you can imagine yourself online with four or 500 other people and you can actually private message each person. Um, and, uh, you know, our events are, are different. You know, we, we tried to maintain the uh, the quality and we also try to maintain the networking aspect. So we want people to see each other and we also do breakout rooms. So we have our companies pitch, we have a dozen companies pitch. And then afterwards, and we poll the investors to see who's interested in these companies. We send those leads over to our presenting companies so they can follow up and get funded. And then they host their own breakout room afterwards for 30 to 40 minutes. So, you know, we're trying to do, it's not the same as in person, Wayne, no. but you know, it's no. um, the best we can do right now, I think. Um, but our What's your vision? Where, are you, where is this headed? You, you mentioned that this might be become a media company at some point. Yeah, it is a media company already because we're producing a lot of content. You know, all our videos are packaged up and put on YouTube and shared on social. And, uh, you know, we, we do have some rich content and we will probably wind up doing a series of multi-day conferences in the U.S., Europe and Asia in the down the road, maybe within three to five years. You know, we're looking at doing some stuff. Um, you know, we have uh, 800 alumni. We're, you know, we're adding to that all the time. We're 3,000 friendly investors that regularly come to all of our events. And then we have 90 something thousand in our community wow. total. So, wow. I, and a lot of people are global. So, depending on the markets that need us and where we can find great partners, where we can be of service, that's sort of our main driver is how can we help? Um, then we'll be considering, you know, going into other cities. But yeah, Connectpreneur will be a thing. And I like it because it's good for my brand. It's good for, I, you know, it's a feel good. It's a triple bottom line type endeavor. It doesn't make a lot of money, but it's something that we're not doing for money. We're doing it for, to help the community and to create value for people. And nothing makes me happier than to see our alumni succeed and to see our investors make tons of money when they, they pick good, good deals. And um, it's quite, quite exciting. What if you were advising young entrepreneurs who want to do what you've done or try to emulate your success? What is the secret to your success? Secret? Um, I think you got to work hard and you got to never give up and focus 100% on your customer, the person who's paying you, and make sure you don't never sacrifice on, st on standards like quality. I think that's why Connectpreneur has grown. We've always we never looked at the bottom line. We never looked at the money. We just quality, you know, is this something we would want to do? Is this a meeting that we would cancel a trip, you know, to go to go to this event? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the standard by which we want Connectpreneur to be. It has to be the top quality event of its kind. And um, I think that's helped us really well. You know, when I built CyberRep, 
which was our our you know contact center company. Uh, we had 2,300 employees. You know, wow. Um, my executive team and I, our goal was always to be the best run company of its size in the world. That was sort of our sort of BHAG, you know, big, hairy, sure. audacious goal. Mm-hmm. And we knew if we were striving to be the best run company of our size in the world, we would always be a good company. So we were private equity backed. Our private equity um, investors would tell us that the company, my, our company reported better than some of their public companies. So it really, I think that really means a lot. If you're able to focus on being the best and not the biggest, then you'll, you'll be pretty successful, you know? So whatever it is, you know, for young kids, I would just say, listen, life is short. Um, I feel like I was in college yesterday and I do have some kid, one kid in college and a couple out of college. And I'll tell you, um, the one thing is life is short. So pursue something that you love. If you don't like, if you don't love it, get out, you know, just make sure you love it. Liking it is not good enough because you're going to be spending all this time and energy doing something. You may as well do something that you really, really, really enjoy that you can't wait to get out of bed to do. And everything else is really a waste of time. Work hard, do the best you can go for the highest quality and do something you love and success will follow. Spoken yeah. by a true expert. <laughs> I what is the greatest that. challenge? I mean, it's worked for me. I got lucky too. I mean, come on, Wayne. We all, you know, like we're all lucky in some ways. Yeah, we all know. are. I mean, luck but is. We a make good. our own luck, don't we? We do make our own luck. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> what, um, what, Tian? What is the greatest challenge that you have faced as an entrepreneur over your career? <sighs> wow, that is a good question. Um, we've had a lot of challenges. You know, you have competition that are constantly beating you up by cutting price by different methods. You have uh, the difficulty in finding A plus talent. It's easy to find B plus talent, even A minus talent. It's hard to find A talent. And A talent is 10X B talent. So that's really the biggest challenge. I think I'm seeing that today too, among entrepreneurs and other CEO buddies of mine and us too, is to find to find really excellent talent is the heart. It's, it's easy to find good talent, but really if you find excellent talent, that's a differentiator between success and mediocrity. How do you define excellent talent? What is somebody who has excellent talent? It's a, it's a very situational, but you know, um, brains is not enough. Hard work ethic is not enough. You need to find someone who matches your, your values, your culture, someone who um, has great communication capability, ability to um, over time learn and, and have the ability to um, sort of read your mind and you can read their mind. And that way you build a well-oiled team. So if you're trying to build the, um, you know, a Super Bowl championship team, you need to have a team. So you need everyone to be on the same page. Um, They, they should have a a high degree of humility and coachability and and a high degree of curiosity. Like if they're curious and they're, that means they're going to be a lifelong learner. What I've, what I've found, you know, it's easy to find smart, hardworking people. Those guys are a dime a dozen. Um, so that's like, for me, that's table stakes. So someone who shares your vision in terms of, you know, they understand that, you know, the values that you support, which is, you know, undying loyalty to your customer, you know, obsession with customer service and doing the best for your customer, honesty, integrity, you know, those are the sort of things that are harder to find. And if you find someone who has that and they have obviously the table stakes stuff, then you're in business. <laughs> then you got to create an environment where they can thrive. So but that's if, really the biggest challenge, I think. I for think me. That's, that's been my biggest challenge as a young, as a new entrepreneur, not young entrepreneur. I'm an old entrepreneur, but I'm, it's, it's always a tough thing to find the A players yeah. and uh, people who do share your vision and, and work as hard as you do and have the intelligence and the foresight and the curiosity and the ability to have a vision uh, all of those things are really hard to put together into one person. And uh, that's the goal. It, it is the goal to find people like that. Let me ask you, the final question is, if we, if any entrepreneurs are listening to this broadcast, and I hope there are a lot that will, how do they connect with Connectpreneur? How do they become a presenter? Oh, I mean, yeah, they can go. We have, uh, so connectpreneur.org is our website. All right. E-O-N-N-E-C-T-P-R-E-N-E-U-R. We have a Twitter handle called Connectpreneur and Instagram called Connectpreneur. We have a couple of Facebook pages and a LinkedIn page. It's all, you can search under Connectpreneur. YouTube, you can search under Connectpreneur. Yeah, so please join us. You know, our, our virtual events are free. 
So if you're interested, just uh, you can log on. We do these monthly, and um, hopefully you'll find you'll find them interesting, <laughs> get some value out of it, or at least some entertainment. And uh, yeah, no, I, I mean it's um, it's something that uh, is very special to us, and and uh, hopefully you know we're we're helping our community. So we've been talking with Tian Wong, and he is an amazing force of nature. I mean, the only thing, the only way I can describe him is he's everywhere. If you look anywhere in the entrepreneurial community in the Washington, D.C. metro area, and hopefully all across the East Coast and soon across the United States and across the world, you're going to find Tian somewhere in the middle of the conversation with some CEO who is building a new and exciting company. So we're really grateful to have you on Blueprint for Wealth, and thanks for being a special guest today. Oh, thank you for having me, Wayne. I'm honored. I really appreciate it. And um, it's great to see you and, and can't wait great to see, to see you, you in person after this thing slows down a little bit. I know. Once we get <laughs> once we get well and, and back in, in circulation. And uh, thanks for joining us for Blueprint for Wealth today, all the listeners out there. And join us next time for a special topic and a special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. I'm Wayne Zell. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.